Hey guys, it's Nick Kruger. Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get the podcast underway. Texas picking up uh, a few retroactive commitments from Baylor's 2016 class. Uh, we talk about Devin Duvernay and Patrick Hudson. Those are the two guys that I've ever actually seen in person before. Uh, obviously, Devin's brother Donovan and fellow offensive lineman J.P. Urquidez uh, are also in the fold there with Texas. We didn't discuss them, but I didn't forget about them either. Also, we do an interview with number one receiver in the country, Trevon Grimes. That interview is a, is a little bit older because we did it during the uh, Rivals Five Star Challenge player registration. If you want to watch that video by itself, you're more than welcome to. It's on the Rivals YouTube channel. Otherwise, I spliced it in with the video version of this uh, entire podcast, and obviously you'll hear it on the audio version as well. So thanks for listening, and here we go. All right, welcome into another edition of the Commitment Issues Podcast. I'm Rob Cassidy. This week, nobody will, Mac. I am joined by Texas man, Nick Kruger, who is settling into Texas in his new home. Uh, we'll have, you know, number one wide receiver in the country, Trayvon Grimes. We'll have an interview that we'll play later in the show. Pretty excited about that. He was great. Talked a little bit about Ohio State. Talked a little bit about Florida, Florida State, and just kind of what it's like to, to be the number one wide receiver in the country. But we'll get to that later uh, for now. You know, it's, it's Nick and I, so no Woody this week, which I'm sure there's a segment of Tennessee fans somewhere celebrating that. Uh, how you doing, Nick? Oh, good. I have, I have a feeling our, our listenership is going to go way, way up once the, uh, once the word hits the street that it's just you and me. We cut the fat, so to speak. Yeah, you'll definitely see a bump in in in, uh, in clicks from Knoxville, I'm sure. Maybe, maybe a dip. You know, I think they might listen to them the way some people listen to Skip Bayless. Yeah, hate listen. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Well, you know, all right, so we should we should uh, dip in, I guess, and, and just get started here and talk about Kellen Mond a little bit, a guy that's from Texas, your neck of the woods, plays his high school football at IMG in my neck of the woods, and committed to Texas A&M. Uh, you know, my thought on that is, you know, the whole thing with Tate Martell went down, and they lost Tate Martell, who was committed to Texas A&M out of Las Vegas originally. Uh, they get Kellen Mond who, despite what the rankings say, I, I think is comparable. I, I mean, I think that you've got more of a, a pro-style quarterback that can do some things like run around, but, you know, he's more of the pro-style prototype, I guess. You know, he stands a little bit taller than Martell, uh, has some more measurables than Martell, and I think can do a lot of the same things Martell did, despite not being vertically challenged. Well, Tate Martell really, you know, influenced this sort of uh, situation with Kellen Mond two ways, right? First, he decommitted from Texas A&M, opening the spot for him to commit eventually. But then I think, you know, going back to past episodes where, where you and Woody had talked about probable landing spots for Mond, you know, the, the clear favorite seemed to be Auburn, right? And then, and then maybe Ohio State number two. And then it turns out Martell commits to Ohio State, so that spot's not there for him anymore. He ends up at Texas A&M. It's really, really crazy, the, the far-reaching effects of, of Tate Martell's decommitment and, and how much we've talked about it and how, how many dominoes have fallen since then and how they've applied you know, directly to Kellen Mond in this case. But, um, you know, I think, I think with, with – and we were trying to figure out, you know, what sort of identity uh, Texas A&M is trying to establish uh, offensively with their new offensive coordinator there. And we were thinking once they took Connor Blumrick, they'd be looking more like a, you know, a traditional sort of offense that doesn't require a quarterback to, to make a lot of, you know, snap decisions as far as, as moving out of the pocket or throwing on the run or anything like that is concerned. Like to your, to your point, Kellen Mond may not be uh, the burner at quarterback as like a, as like a dual threat option, but he does have, uh, you know, more athletic ability, we'll say, than, than, a than a Connor Blumrick does. And, you know, when I talked to, uh, Matt Clare, who, who runs the, the Lone Star Prep site here in our network about Texas A&M taking two quarterbacks and, and how, you know, Blumrick might, uh, you know, view this commitment by Mond, he said that Blumrick knew all along that Texas A&M was planning on taking two quarterbacks. So, you know, I, I think it's kind of a low pressure situation for each and uh, and one with tremendous upside for Mond, especially because if he comes in and gives them an in-state uh, prospect that they can hang their hat on, you know, things things could be looking, you know, th there could be a turnaround in, in uh, people's optimism for, for Texas A&M in a very short period of time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the reason for the pessimism is A, the overall product on the field last year, but B, the quarterback situation has just been such a mess at A&M uh, in the last, you know, 16 months or whatever. And this provides a little bit of stability. I think they still have weapons at wide receiver. So if they can have a guy like Mon that can get these guys the ball in space, you know, Rob Cassidy's favorite Christian Kirk is in that offense. That's right. Who, you know, I, I fi famously pounded the table for to make a five-star and everybody told me I was crazy. But 
look at Christian Kirk now, but they have guys like that. You get these guys the ball in space where, you know, if you can just sit back there, sit in the pocket, be accurate, and get these guys on screen passes and little out routes, they can make plays happen. So I don't think A&M's that far away from being competitive again, as much as the, you know, the, the lexicon and the public is way down on them right now. And, you know, everybody likes to make fun of Texas A&M. I, I don't think that they're that far away from being competitive. And and when you look at this class specifically that Mond is coming in with, you know, they only have uh, one, you know, I guess bona fide pass catcher uh, in their in their class so far right now, and that's Kenel, uh Kenel McZeal, who's kind of you know sort of a under the radar type guy. He's somebody I've seen at a seven on seven tournament a couple months ago. Big body dude uh, likes to run you know vertically and win jump balls because he's not a he's not a burner. I think a lot of people are projecting him to end up being more of a, a pass catching tight end option. And uh, Roshnod Paul, who's an athlete that everybody's really excited about when you watch his film, he's juking everybody out all the way up and down the field. Um, you know, so I think when you add that in with Christian Kirk and, you know, some of the offensive creativity that Texas A&M has been been known for, you know, I, I think they have, you know, I think they have all the potential in the world to, to make a quick turnaround. We'll just see how quickly, you know, I, I, lo- looking at, you know, looking at the, the fan perception of, of A&M's recruiting strategy, it definitely, you know, it definitely seems like there's there's totally a wait and see sort of mentality in terms of the, there's there's some unknowns with some of the guys that they're taking. But that doesn't mean that they're not good players. It just means. You know, you got to find the right fit for him. You got to get him worked in, and you got to see how they all play well together. So, speaking of guys being recruited in Texas, uh, I know that what's been taking up a lot of your time lately is what Iowa's doing down there. You know, they've always had a presence in Texas. I guess it's not shocking, but they've really come in there and are kind of making some noise in the Lone Star State now, right? Is this a? It seems like there's there's been a door opened there, and I don't want to say it's because of Baylor. But, you know, it's less crowded right now. You know, nobody is itching to run to Baylor right now, no matter what. So, you know, that's more food for everybody else's plate, I guess. And you think Iowa's benefiting from that, or are these different guys that they're coming in and signing? No, I, I, well, I think generally speaking, it's a, it's a different it's a different group of guys uh, than, than the ones Baylor was in the mix for. I mean, none of Baylor's decommitments specifically ended up going to Iowa. I think really what what you're seeing it with, in Iowa's situation this year um, – and, and you would you'd be able to speak more to their tradition recruiting in the state than I would because you're you're from more of the or you've spent more time in this region than I have despite uh, me being the Texas analyst now. But um, but when you look at when you look at this class and how it's developed, I mean, really, uh, a lot of it is hinged on Eno Benjamin, um, you know, the the four star running back that we you know that we gave a big boost in the rankings this time around because he's really acting. Uh, as the de facto quarterback in the class as far as recruiting other kids goes, he's really been the mouthpiece for the staff from Iowa in the state of Texas. Um, and now they've they've added their quarterback in this class and Peyton Manziel, uh, you know, also from the Texas area. And then they uh, just recently got... You want to talk about a name there, man. We're just like, <laughs> we're just mashing, you know, high profile college quarterbacks names together and hoping it, hoping it goes, the, goes for the best. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, it's spe- his last name spelt differently than, than uh, you know, the one, you know, than the Manziel that you and I know and love. But, um, but you know, he's, he's got to make, he's got to have his own identity, right? So maybe that, <laughs> that's where it comes into play. But, but anyway, so Eno has been on the case for a long time, pounding the pavement, the phone lines, talking to guys. They just got Matt Hankins. Uh, three-star defensive back that we saw this spring at our Rivals Camp Series event in Dallas. And he seems to be, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not the most polished defensive back that you'll ever see, but definitely a guy that, you know, is an effective player and somebody that you can be excited about. They got another receiver in Gavin Holmes, who we hadn't seen in person this spring. I, I wanted him to be at the Kansas City camp, uh, and he wasn't able to make it up there. But, you know, Dallas to Kansas City is something, something what, like eight hours or something like that. So, oh, no way, man. It's, uh, I've made that drive many. Well, yeah, it's about it's about six and a half. Oh, seven. really? I don't know. You can you can get to uh, Dallas to where I am in Wichita right now for a wedding in five. And then it's another two and a half probably. So now you're, you're probably right. I don't know if I've ever made the Dallas to Kansas City drive. Well, but I have often made the Dallas to Manhattan, Kansas drive. Yeah, but I mean his effectiveness as a player isn't contingent on him coming to our camps. You know what I mean? I, I, his he, The thing that he's known for, he's not the biggest dude, but he's definitely got you know speed to spare. Um, and when you look at the guy, uh, the other guys that they've taken in this class, I know the other receiver that they got uh, from Mississippi so far uh, after their, their tailgater event is a, a big body, you know, maybe not the... There's 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 definitely a contrast in player profiles between Gavin Holmes and 
Uh, I think I think the kid's name is Smith. I can't remember his first name because if he's not in my region, he doesn't matter, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know the feeling for sure. <laughs> but the other two, but they, but the, but the thing is, they've only got four commitments in the class officially right now from Texas, but they're definitely in the mix for a lot more. Eno plays a big part in that, you know, trying to get these guys interested. The one guy that they're really making the hard press for is uh, Cameron Buckley who uh, goes to Cedar Hill High School in the Dallas area. He's a four-star wide receiver. And Cedar Hill, Jalen Jackson is a a Colorado uh, commit, and then they also have uh, Charleston Rambo, who's an Oklahoma commit. I mean, they've got got all kinds of offensive players out there at Cedar Hill. So uh, if he joins up with that Iowa class, he gives them more of, like, the balance between the speed and the size. He's the more well-rounded type of receiver. So they're really doing a nice job, not only – recruiting in the state of Texas, but really piecing together a, you know, a class of complementary parts all cr- across the board there. Yeah, they, you know, that's Texas is so important for them because, you know, despite what you might have heard of the football mecca that is Iowa, not a lot of top prospects coming out of that state. So, you know, they spot recruit in Florida. They do a little bit elsewhere, but they have to make their living there in Texas, really. I mean, maybe not have to because they've got by doing it you know, without doing that, you know, in the distant past. But I mean, I think if you're Iowa, that's where you want to live is in Texas. right? Definitely. And in and, and, and a story I wrote a couple, you know, a couple of weeks ago, or whatever, I can't remember what it was about specifically, but I was going back and looking at the at the uh, recruiting classes that Iowa has put together over the past couple of years. They haven't had a four star signee in the in the last uh, three or four years. I can't remember per our rivals ranking so I mean they're really capitalizing on the success that they had last year it's like it's one of these perfect storm situations where the guys that they're going for in Texas you know gravitate to them in conjunction with the success that they had last season it's all but the guys in Texas are good players legitimately good players they're not just recruiting Texas for the sake of recruiting Texas you know what I mean so so everything everything's coming together and you know if they if they pull a few more of these you know higher ranked uh, pieces that they're that they're looking at I mean you know, this is this is really, uh, you know, it's a marquee class for them in, in terms of, of their footprint in the state of Texas, for sure. Yeah, so maybe, like you said, it's not really the same guys that Baylor was looking at that they're coming in. But who has benefited from Baylor is another team in your state, and that is Texas, who, speaking of schools that everybody loves to make fun of, uh, you know, they're doing well. You know, they needed this, too. Like, you know, they were becoming kind of, you know, a punchline <laughs> for everyone. Everybody loves that because when you're a high-profile school, you know, it's just like the Notre Dame effect. When you have that reputation, you know, nobody likes more than to make fun of those kind of schools, right? They're like the Yankees of, uh, you know, all the money, the Yankees of college football. But nobody's laughing right now. You know, it's a really crappy situation, and we won't get into that on what happened at Baylor. It's just not, I mean, obviously nobody wants to talk about that. It's been discussed ad nauseum. But – Texas has kind of reaped some benefits from the situation and, and you know, it, it keeps going and this is what they needed. Don't you think? I mean, they really needed some kind of break and this may have been that break for them. When you look at the way they fit for, for as good as a finish as we saw Texas have last year on national signing day. And, you know, we were all putting, you know, doing our semi live show <laughs> and we were watching the, the flips and the commitments that Texas was getting, you know, and we were as good as that class was, the only five star that they ended up getting was linebacker Eric Fowler. You know, the flip from from LSU. Everybody else was a four star, or, uh, you know, not a four star. So, um, and even even Fowler, there was some concern that he wasn't going to be able to make, uh, you know, get through the clearinghouse with his grades and uh, be eligible to play this season. So that would have left him without a five star. And here you are now, uh, you know, a, a year later, and you're looking at who they already have in the 2017 class. They've already got off to a good start with some of the guys that they've had in terms of the four stars that they've already had committed. But now you're looking at the guys that they're adding retroactively from, from the, from the Baylor crisis. And uh, you see Devin Duvernay, a wide receiver that we saw do very well at at Under Armour last at the end of last year. Um, You know, a guy that doesn't have a lot of, you know, wiggle and shake and, and flash and shimmy when you watch him run routes, but he's very fast. You know, he's built, he's, he's built very well. He's definitely a guy that's going to be a difference maker in an offense because they're trying to, and still a more up-tempo, faster-paced offense, which is, um, you know, I think we're going to see some some growing pains with in the in the short term because they have a lot of big-bodied, you know, kind of, uh, you know, st- power type of players instead of instead of the smaller, you know, faster scoot around players like they like they kind of would need to get you know hurry that hurry that transition along. But Duvernay is a guy that can come in and and fit you know kind of the best of both worlds for him at, at wide receiver and definitely help out a guy in Shane Bouchelle who's obviously a, a young quarterback coming in and expected to, you know, to lead the team next season. Um, you know, and he, and he left, for, he was able to get out of his Baylor. Uh, well, and I, and I don't even think he was a situation where 
um, it was like an exemption for him with the crisis. I think Baylor just outright, there was some sort of paperwork snafu where they just didn't file his letter of intent or something like that. There was some sort of extra ingredient. That, yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> they never they never sent the thing over. So he was just like pretty much a free agent. Yeah. <laughs> and thought he was signed, but nobody informed him either. So once they started looking into it, it was like, oh, by the way, this letter of intent just got like lost in a stack of – uh, insurance papers or something, <laughs> and, and you're good to go. Like you, you actually aren't on a team. It was in the it was in the Valpac uh, mail inserts that they got with the <laughs> prescription. Yeah. You know, it was in there with a the credit card application. We accidentally shredded it, and it was, it was a whole that's, it was a whole problem. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, so so that was so that was strange in itself. But now, but now you look recently, they've also picked up Patrick Hudson, who was also at the Under Armour game last year, a, a, a highly rated guy uh, that we had coming out of the 2016 class. And um, you know, you can never have you know, you can never have enough quality offensive linemen. You know, I personally think that he's he's got some things to work on, but uh, but you know what? I mean, he's got plenty of time to do. He physically he comes in and and genetically, you know, he fits the he fits the bill of a guy that you want to see coming in as a as a big bodied offensive lineman there. That, that you know that can definitely, if nothing else, add depth for him. Uh, you know, so they so they're starting to get a little trickle uh, trickle through with some of those. Uh, some of those guys that made it out. And not to spend too much time on this because we've got to move on, but, you know, I think the bigger picture, and I always said they needed a break like this because what they pulled off on signing day, you and Woody, who's not here, and I have all agreed that that was very calculated. Like, these commitments were in hand. They told them to hold off because they wanted to make a splash because they thought they needed that kind of splash because their name had started to kind of fade as far as recruiting goes. I think that worked. But you can't do that a second year. Like you, you, that's a thing you can do once because now if, if the results aren't there on the field to ask these people to hold off and to try to pull that again, isn't going to work. You need to get off to a start and you need to maintain momentum recruiting and carry that into a really important season for Charlie strong, who really needs to perform. I'm not saying that he's going to get fired if he doesn't this year, but I think that anybody listening to this would agree that this is a pretty critical season for him and how he's perceived and how that trajectory is going to go for his career. Um, you know, Texas people aren't as patient, <laughs> those fans, and you know, they shouldn't be. I mean, that's a program with some history that, you know, those <laughs> there's expectations and you know what you're taking when you get the job and the recruiting is just as important. Uh, so he's got to perform on the field and he's got to maintain some kind of momentum on the recruiting trail. So I think this break that they got uh, from a very unfortunate situation at Baylor came at a, a really, really good time for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and they, but you know, and, and I think, I think the other schools too, uh, the other schools in, in the big 12 and in the Texas region, you know, are privy to, you know, to what Texas did at the end of, at the end of last year, you would, I would expect them to be, you know, it, it hasn't quite happened yet, but I would, I would expect, you know, I would expect the other Texas and the other big 12 schools to really start twisting the arms of some guys that they, that they know are Texas targets because they don't want, you know, they don't want to get snake bit again the way that they did last year. So back from Texas to Florida now again, where uh, we'll go ahead and play an interview that I did with Trayvon Grimes at the Rivals Five Star Challenge a few weeks ago. You'll hear us talk about a satellite camp uh, in that interview that took place at his high school that Ohio State held there, you know, for obvious reasons, uh, as if it is in the future. That camp has been held. Uh, you know, it was in the future when we recorded it. You know, we also went into maybe why some other websites don't have him ranked as highly as Rivals does, where we have him as the number one wide receiver in the country, and just about what it's like to be a number one wide receiver. So I will pass it off to myself uh, in Atlanta with Trayvon Grimes. All right, here with Trayvon Grimes, the top wide receiver in the country. Yeah. What's it been like so far? You just walked in and we just like hijacked you and put you at a table? Yeah, I mean, I know I just, I walked in. I mean, I sort of already knew what it was going to be like. I, I mean, I came here last year, so uh, I kind of was ready for it, but you know. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get the recruiting stuff out of the way up front and be done with it. You just yeah. we're doing an interview with Mike Farrell. Ohio State's been your leader. Yeah. So you give it to him in order. So I guess give it to us for podcast listeners. Like, what's the pecking order there? The you want the order? Yeah. What they do. Uh, Ohio State, Florida, Florida State, um, Miami, Georgia, Alabama. And people don't, I think people know now that you're from the Midwest originally. Yeah. But I guess, like, you know, what's what's the story for Trayvon Grimes? Like, how did you end up from Illinois to Florida? Like, how did uh, that end up happening for you? Um, well, Indiana, Indi- Indiana to correct you, but ah, all Indiana. Right. No, no, you, um, so everything that's not California or Florida or New York is yeah, the same state. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Well, Indiana football is, I guess you could say, not as talented as Florida football. And my dad's always known that. So uh, one day I was in my room and he came down. And he was just like, Trey, uh, you want to move to Florida to uh, pursue your dreams? And immediately I was like, no, nah. I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm not. And then I guess I could, so I could, court, I could say like he, he forced me and he was just like, we're gonna go. I, I believe in you. I believe in your, your talents. Like this is what we're gonna do. And 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 I, would, I agreed into it. And I got down here my first year. I didn't like it. Second year I did sort of good. And then my third year was my, which was my eighth grade year. I, I kind of excelled. So ever since then I've started to love it. And and football just took off and rocket ship so so when you moved down <laughs> yeah. was st thomas always picked it's like all right yeah, i'm gonna go dad, to this football powerhouse yeah, my, that was the plan for yeah, me yeah once my dad walked into my room and and well, no actually one day i walked into my dad's room and i seen him on the computer like st thomas this st thomas that and i was just like what school is that and then i and now i know what school it was because i'm here and i've how did he know about st thomas uh his dad his dad lives down here, and his dad was okay. telling him about this powerhouse school that like your son needs to go to, blah blah blah, and and he just bought into it, and ever since then, uh, I'm here now. So, is that a different <laughs> like you know people go to you know regular high schools, whatever, and St. Thomas is a regular high school by all yeah. accounts, but you know it's you know it's got that football mm -hmm. tradition. It's yeah. got guys that are yeah. on the two deep. People, your backups are gonna end up playing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's that like every day? And like, is it? Oh, uh, it's a it's a, it's an honor. Uh, I, get, I, I go against the best every day. That's what I tell everybody. Uh, all these people say, um, you're, you're, you're this, you're overrated, you're blah, blah. I say it. I go against the best every day. Uh, who do you go against? So so I feel like if I go against the best every day, Asante Samuels in, in South Florida has the best football in the country. Uh, how, can you, how can you not uh, see yourself being the best? So that's what I feel like. Speaking of overrated, I gotta ask you about the rankings then, right? Like we, for whatever reason, at Rivals.com are higher on you than everybody else in the yeah, world. Yeah. What What happened there? Why do you think that everybody else has got you a little bit? I mean, everybody's got you as like the fourth or fifth wide receiver yeah. in the country. I mean, I feel like I mean, I won't say any names. I just I just feel like I really couldn't even give you an explanation. No, you were to telling me opinion. off air though that something happened yeah, at the opening, uh, right? I saw at, that the story. at the opening at the opening regionals, I guess I didn't have too strong of a performance. Uh, Due to due to uh, something that occurred the day before, <laughs> um, the quote is out on the water. Come on. Um, so so me and my quarterback, you know, Jake Allen, he's a he's a he's a clown. So me and him, we we went out on the water. We recorded this big this big video. Uh, I saw it. Uh, him throwing me the ball, blah blah blah, this and that. And uh, well, I guess guess you could say the water got me drained. We was out there all day from sun up to sundown, and then um. Next morning, right next morning at 5 a.m., I had to wake up for this, for this, uh, I guess you could say, bleach report thing. I had yeah, to wake that, up. the yeah. other video, yeah. The other video, so so I guess I could say my body was just drained. I didn't have any... Yeah, well, know. it's amazing that people don't expect kids to be kids sometimes. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I just went out there, didn't have too strong of a performance, and then ever since then, I guess they just, they, they've been, they've been bumping me down, but... But it's all it's all right though. No, yeah, yeah. I figured you're not one that seems to like. Yeah. You don't text me when your ranking comes out and yell at me. That you're no, high I'm not. Sure. I'm not. I'm not too worried about that. I I know what I can do. I know, I know about uh, I know if I'm I, I know if if I'm personally better than somebody or who else. So if they have me ranked above, if they have them ranked above me, and I personally know I'm better than them, it really doesn't bother me. So so Jake, you, you mentioned Jake, who's committed yeah. to Florida. He's your quarterback there. Yeah. What's you know I know how he is. You know. Yeah. So he's he's on you a little bit about Florida or what? Like uh, how's the conversation? The he's on me all the time. Uh, he before 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 he he wasn't on me as much, but but now he he's on me. Uh, Every day we, we he talks. We talks about Florida, uh, what he sees in Florida, what he sees I can do in Florida. Um, I'm actually gonna go um, visit Florida with him, hopefully soon, and um, just get another just get another feel for it. Uh, the last time I went up there, I, I liked a, I liked every a lot of things about Florida. So. Um, I feel like next time I go back up there, some more things can spark. I'm one that's always laughing at you when you're releasing top sixes or whatever <laughs> because I'm telling you, it does not the two schools, right? It's been Ohio State forever. Is it just the hometown thing with Ohio State? Or, like, why have they been the leader since the – it seems like they, they offered you, and from there, you know, did you grow up rooting for them? Like, why why have uh, they been well, so dominant? Well, since I'm from around that area, I grew – I did grow up uh, – I did grow up lo loving them, uh, liking them a lot. So, um, therefore, then when I moved down to um, Florida – I went to St. Thomas, and it just so happened that Chris Carter was my wide receiver coach for my first, for my first uh, two years. So it was just like, wow, what a coincidence! And then, yeah, funny how that works. Yeah, funny how that worked <laughs> out. And then me and him just started talking about 
about uh, Ohio State and and his career at Ohio State was phenomenal. So, I mean, it just him being my coach and and me always liking Ohio State. It, it was like, why not? And uh, Chris Carter's always a good guy to have around. Yeah, he he could, he teaches me. He taught me a lot of things. Uh, he still does, and and he's just always a good guy to have around. So therefore, I I felt like uh, that was that was in my best interest at the time. So let me ask you this before I let you go. Is so much has been made of satellite camps, and it's mainly for dorks like us to talk about and make fun of Jim Harbaugh or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But there's one happening at your high school that yeah. Ohio State is putting on. Do yeah. you like, I mean, obviously you're self-aware enough. Do you sit yeah. back and you're like, the only reason this is happening is because they're recruiting me? I mean, you get uh, that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I really... Like that would not be happening if Trayvon Grimes did not exist, correct? No, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that big. I feel like they, 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 they come down and, you know... Give, but they give pick a high school else. for a reason. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, at, in that aspect, then yeah. But in the bigger picture, I feel like they're, they're, there's other kids that that they're trying to give an opportunity to. So, what did they tell you about it when you talked? If you talked to them about the camp at your high school, obviously, I know you're in contact. with uh, them. What are they telling you about about that camp and how's it? How's it uh, no, they're just. They're, I'm just uh, talking to Coach Smith. Uh, they're talking. Uh, he's just saying he's looking forward to um, seeing me. I'm looking forward to seeing him. Uh, that's about it. I haven't, honestly, I haven't seen them, seen Coach Smith for a while. So I'm looking forward to actually seeing him and seeing him in person, and not just speaking with him over text. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it, Trevor. Sure, Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right, that was uh, past Rob, and now this is future Rob uh, alongside Nick Kruger still, where it is time for everybody's favorite part of the show. Rants and recommendations. The rants will be late on rants this week, probably because Womack's not here, and Womack is a uh, rant specialist. You know, if he was, uh, <laughs> if, if he, if, you know, if ranting was a sport, this man would be Michael Jordan combined with Mike Trout, combined with LeBron James, combined with Brett Hull. Uh, but <laughs> instead, it is us. So, what you got, Nick? You got a rant or a recommendation? Well, I, you know, kind of. It's kind of an anti-recommendation. It's not quite a rant. Uh, I mean, I guess it could be if I talked long enough about it. I went to go see uh, the new Independence Day movie over the weekend, Independence Day Resurgence, which is the is the obvious sequel to, you know, a, a pillar of my you know adolescence uh, cinema experience. The in the the all time great Will Smith, Jeff Goldblum thriller, Independence Day, of course. Uh, You've seen I, Independence I not. Day, though, right? Uh, that it's a complete. Uh, you've never seen. You've nope. never seen. It's a complete okay, blind spot right, for me, second, man. Not only have I not seen the sequel, I know nothing about the sequel. Is Will Smith in the sequel? I have not seen the original either. I do know that Will Smith saved the world from aliens. Uh, that's part of the American lexicon, right? But I've not actually ever seen the movie. Well, listen. Okay, so all right. So I change. I changed what I'm saying. For, first of all, the recommendation is for you to go see Independence Day, the the original one. The, sec- the second recommendation is for you to not see the Independence Day <laughs> is Will Smith, so Will Smith is not in the sequel, correct? Or he is? W- Will Smith, uh, I, I, I'm going to give minor spoilers away here. Will Smith is, is, is not in the sequel. He, he's referenced many times. They use his photo likeness several times throughout the course of the movie. They even have, in, in the Independence Day Resurgence world, he has a, a painted portrait in the White House as a national hero. But he is a, he is not in the movie. He's only his only affiliation is he's the father of one of the main characters who. Oh goes man, on to that fight seems very lazy. Movie, I have so. not seen the original, but boy, any time that like you write an actor off or you can't get him on, and your thing is all right, well then we'll just make it his kid. That is a bad sign. That's like you know the laziest filmmaking well, trope in the world. Well, listen. So here's so here's the situation. Uh, my understanding is Will Smith was not in the Independence Day sequel because he chose to act in Suicide Squad instead. Oh. <laughs> which is a, which is a movie I I'm personally after especially after having seen the Independence Day sequel I'm significantly more excited for the Suicide Squad movie than I am Independence Day too so so that at the moment right now that seems like he made the he made the smart choice between the two of them so uh, but I'll reserve judgment on that until after I after I see Suicide Squad but I mean boy oh boy Independence Day too I mean really just you know just smacked of uh, laziness in terms of you know, putting the movie together. Certainly the special effects were great. You know, there were fun alien fight sequences with spaceships and things like that. But as far as as far as any explanation as to where people, is something as simple as to where people were in the, you know, continental United States at any <laughs> given moment when the story was happening, there was just no explanation about any small details. It, you know, it had such a weird pace to the whole the whole thing. You know, not a ton of character development, and and they asked you 
to they, they just assumed that uh, several of the characters that were uh, that that had come back for you know like that were previous characters in the original it they just made assumptions that you knew who they were there was no sort of explanation uh another dis- another key part of disappointment uh for me was Hunter uh Hunter King's sister I think her name is Joey King and you wouldn't know who Hunter King is I don't imagine but she's a very attractive actress on The Young and the Restless which I've been known to watch her sister's in it and uh and it has a, a sort of likeness to her and she is her story her side storyline is the most forgettable you know non-essential part to the entire movie in a, in a plot line filled with non-essential pieces to the movie so uh you know so they really dropped the ball in a couple of different areas there were some unintentional funny moments because of you know how how silly the movie was but uh other than that man my recommendation is to save the 12 bucks and whatever you spend on popcorn and uh, you know, watching oh, Netflix. Boy. Yeah, stuff. you know, sequels almost never end well. You know, I, I, I try to stay away from them unless it's a movie that I really, really loved. Um, there just aren't – it's just not a good bet. You know, it's not a wise investment. You know, even if you're buying low and expecting low things, like it's – it never works out. I guess I don't have a recommendation this week. I do have a mini rant. Um, and I understand that this is going to sound very selfish and hipster. And, you know, I'm all for people making a buck, so good for these people. But you and I both listen to the same wrestling podcast, the Cheap Heat podcast. So I found out about a small little t-shirt company via that website called Homage, which makes these very like uh, old school, like 80s looking soft wrestling t-shirts. I'm actually wearing the Ric Flair one right now uh, as we as we record this. And, you know, everything was always in stock and I've got two or three of them and I love it. Until LeBron James starts wearing this Ultimate Warrior shirt and Undertaker shirt, and now it's sold out. I tried to get on there the other day to get uh, the Stone Cold Steve Austin shirt. Every wrestling shirt on that website is just gone now because our boy LeBron decided to make this company mainstream. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll adjust my, my dark rim hipster glasses here. when I, you know, I feel like I was part of the founding fathers of this trend, right? You know, there weren't very many people walking around with these shirts. And now they can't even keep up with demand because LeBron James has – who I – I also suspect it's probably not an actual wrestling fan. Uh, is has, has ruined it for all of us, and everything's back ordered. Yeah, Jeez. it's bad news, man. Man, and I can vouch for the for for how much I like those those shirts too, because as you and me have discussed before, the actual WWE shirts are that heavy duty cotton that doesn't feel good to the t- it feels like wearing sandpaper. Yeah, you know, the designs are pretty crummy in a lot of cases. You know, and you and you see these these homage shirts and you're just like man see this is what it should be you know comfortable fun, how does the easy? wwe not do better yep. at making shirts you know what they do best is make uh highlight packages and like vignettes like when, when they're looking back at like a big few they're That's so true. good at that but as good as they are at that they're so true. bad at making t-shirts well, at their core, they are a promotion uh, company, and that's what those vignettes are. I've I've often as many videos as I make, I'm often in awe of uh, the video video promotions that they do, and I'm like, there's no way I could uh, I could I could do that sort of thing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, you know, just just like the rest of, of of the wrestling industry, Rob, there's there's far more disappointments than there are joys to take. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and I am very disappointed in LeBron James right now. With that, we, you know, we'll wrap it up. Big shout out to M. Deuce, whose music is playing in the background right now. And you know, we'll be big shout out to Trevon Grimes for joining us, and we will be back next week uh, with Womack back, who I'm sure with two weeks to stew in his Womack anger, we'll have plenty of things to yell and scream about. Thanks, Nick. <laughs>